but she's got the name Durban. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was like put on here for effect because she couldn't have, he couldn't have married both women? Surely, no, he's not up to that sort of mischief, is he? As well. Well, a <laughs> few years before this census, we have a marriage certificate in 1856. Right. And down here. Look at that. Frederick John Durban, Sarah King. They did get married then? Yeah. Well, I never. What's the name of that when you do that? Bigamy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, he's definitely married Sarah while he's still married to Sophia. Was there a... What was the punishment for that in those days? It's punishable by um, going to prison. It's all fine. It's very... It's, you don't do it. It's against the law. Actor Warwick Davis lives in East Anglia with his wife and two children. Look at the nice new cars. Having a strong family around you is hugely important. And I'm really lucky to have my wife, Sam, and my kids, Annabelle and Harrison, as my solid rock foundations. Look at you. It's a little Lego figure. And I strongly believe that no, I wouldn't be the person that I am without them. Come on, who wants to be beaten? Go and have fun. Be careful, guys. Let's go. Drive careful. Warwick owes his big break as an actor at the age of 11 to his grandmother. She heard a radio commercial, and it was basically Lucasfilm, who makes Star Wars, looking for short people to appear in Return of the Jedi. The fact that I was short gave me a lucky break, and I've took advantage of that. So here I am, 35 years later, still running with that opportunity, and I have my grandmother to thank for it. I don't think there'll be any other performers in my family history. Yeah, I'm not expecting that at all. I'd like people in my history to be a little bit maverick, a little bit. Yeah, ducking and diving, wheeling and dealing, perhaps. Because I don't tend to follow the rules. I'd be excited to discover stories of people overcoming a challenge and, you know, making something of their lives. There's a couple of bands through there where you're just clinging on <laughs> for dear life. And I won't be embarrassed by whatever I discover. <laughs> yeah, bring it on. <laughs> Let's have an adventure. see my mum today. I'm hoping that she might know a little bit about some of the people in our family. Fingers crossed you'll have a nugget of information that'll set me on my way. Warwick's parents separated when he was a teenager. His mum, Sue, now lives in Sussex. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Fine, thank you. Mm. Lovely mm. to see you. Mm. And you. Come and in, you. come in. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm kind of on a bit of a journey at the minute, trying to figure out where I come from, basically. Mm -hmm. I know you're my mum, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all about beyond that, what, what, further back than that. We never really talked about it, did no, we? No, I know. As a family, I think we no. should have spoken a lot more about it, but my mother, she never really told me anything. So, have you ever done any research into our family history? Well, I have done a little here, which helps you see the line that we go back. There's me and Kim. There's you and Kim coming up to me and Dad. That's a relief. <laughs> and then we come up here to my parents were called Winifred, which was your nana, oh, yeah. and Walla Edward. Great names, Winifred and Walla. Mm. Fabulous. Mm. We don't have names like that anymore, do we? And that's your great-grandfather, and his name was McGregor. And then, of course, he goes up to your great great grandmother. Frederick Durban. Who was Frederick Caroline Durban? Mm. Wow. And we also found out that McGregor was a postman. Ah. And also the great granddad, Frederick Durban, he was a postman. Really? Mm. I wondered why I had a strange affinity for our postman. Yeah. I always like to chat to him for some reason. Oh, do you? Oh, there yeah. you go. It's in your genes. So, Frederick Durban is my great, great, 
grandfather. That's right. I need to find out more about him, I think. Mm -hmm. Warwick's ordered up the birth certificate for his great-great-grandfather, Frederick Durban. Right. This should be the birth certificate of my great-great-grandfather, Frederick Durban. He was born on July the 19th, 1841. Frederick Durban King. His father was called Frederick John Durban, which is a bit confusing because they've both got the same name. So we got Frederick Senior, Frederick Junior. His mum was Sarah King. So it looks like Frederick Junior's mum and dad weren't married because they've both got different surnames. So that makes Frederick Durban King an illegitimate child. But, I mean, that's horrible to label, isn't it, really? I mean, it's just it's still their son, whatever happens, so... Don't mind that. To find out more about the family, Warwick is looking up Frederick Senior on the census from 1841. Let's see what we get. So we've got here Fred Durban, so Frederick Senior, age. 35, another letter carrier in the parish or township of Croydon. The next person listed is... Oh, it doesn't match Sarah there. It's another Durban. Soph... Sophia Durban. Who's that? Ooh. That could have been his wife. So the list continues below. Oh, there's loads of kids. Look at them all. It's a huge list here. Mm. So he was married and he had a child with Sarah while he was married by the look of it here. Ooh. I don't know what to take away from this other than a lot more questions. discovered is potentially quite uh, an awkward situation. You know, and I want to make sure I've got the facts right here. But it's, it's kind of intriguing, isn't it? I mean, I didn't think this early on I'd discovered something quite so exciting as this. Warwick's come to Croydon where, according to the census, Frederick Senior was living in 1841. He's meeting historian Fern Riddell. Hello. Fern, I'm a bit confused about the family situation. So, can you figure out what's going on? Is it, as it seems, to be a bit, uh, a bit naughty? Well, I have some records for you that might shed a bit of light on this. Cool. So I have a census record. We're now in 1861. And on here, we have Frederick Durban. Yeah. And he is here with Sophia, his wife, and one of their daughters. Very good. Very good. But for the same census, in 1861, we also have Fred, senior, living with another S. Durban, wife. Well, I never. And the entry below is a very ornate F. That's Frederick Jr. Yeah. Called him, yeah. So this is Sarah, then, perhaps? Yep. In Deptford, this one is. Yep. So he had two houses, or he was registered at two houses according to census of the same year, yes? Mm -hmm. Wow. He's pretty light on his feet then, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Goodness me. That's excellent, isn't it? So, I mean, it's, I mean it's, it is excellent. It's fun. <laughs> what a crafty thing. Yeah. He must have been stressed out, honestly. <laughs> I mean, one wife's bad enough, but mm. trying to... I mean, but she's got the name Durban. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was, like, 
put on here for effect because she couldn't have, he couldn't have married both women, surely? <laughs> no, he's not up to that sort of mischief, is he, as well? Well, a <laughs> few years before this census, we have a marriage certificate in 1856. Right. And down here... Look at that. Frederick John Durban, Sarah King. They did get married, then? Yeah. Well, I never. What's the name of that when you do that? Bigamy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, he's definitely married Sarah while he's still married to Sophia. Was there a... What was the punishment for that in those days? It's punishable by um, going to prison. It's all a fine. It's very... It's You don't do it. It's against the law. Bigamy is something we do see in the Victorian period. Because divorce wasn't really an option, relationships broke down, and if you wanted to move forward and you fell in love with someone else, you didn't really have a lot of options. You either had to wait for your first partner to die, or you married secretly and bigamously and hoped that no one would find out. See, we don't know from this document whether they had come to some sort of arrangement between mm. themselves. Look, we can't get divorced, love. It's a bit, you know, what it's like in these times. Yeah. I'll... I'm going to go live with Sarah, but for census, I'll put it on in look, and it will be fine. She'll go, yeah. yeah, I look good as well. That could have happened, couldn't it? It could have. It's like a farce a little bit, isn't it? <laughs> it's a, you're trying to live these two lives at the same time and it's... it goes out one door, comes in another. <laughs> it's sort of... It's fantastic. And the fact that he was a postman, it's just... You couldn't have written this better, <laughs> I don't think. It's fabulous. Warwick's confirmed that his great-great-great-grandfather, Frederick Senior, had two families. One in Croydon, with Sophia, and one in Deptford, with Sarah, the mother of Warwick's great-great-grandfather, Frederick Junior. <laughs> Frederick Senior, he's a bit of a rascal, isn't he, really? But, you know, you don't know the circumstances. You know, we know, we know some of the story, but we really don't know what was going on in his personal life with his own wife at the time and, you know, the stress of having six children running around. I was surprised that he did also marry Sarah. But imagine if he hadn't met her, I wouldn't be here. And that's what this is all about at the end of the day, isn't it? How I became me and am here today. And it's all due to the fact that he one day met Sarah and indeed had a child with her, my great-great-grandfather. I hope it ended happily, really, but I don't see how it can because somebody's going to lose, aren't they, in those situations? Either Sophia or Sarah's going to lose. To find out how Frederick Senior managed to lead a double life, Warwick's meeting local historian Carol Roberts. Let's have a look at his life in Croydon. This is dated January 1841, and it's what's called a rate book. Right, and, and 1841 was the year that Frederick Junior was born. Yes, yeah. that's true. This is a list of those that were due to pay the rates in Croydon. Which so... is the sort of tax? Yes. Ah, so there's Frederick there. We'll follow this across That's here. Right. That's the rateable value. £28.10. And... Now, this is the next year. This is the rate book of January 1842. This is George Street. We're no longer yeah. in the High Street, so he has moved around the corner to George Street in Better. Croydon. Let's have a look. That figure there. £13.10. Yes. This is half the price. Exactly. He's gone down market here. Or maybe he had to reduce his outgoings because he is indeed supporting another family in Deptford, perhaps paying rent over there as well. I can't imagine he could carry this on for long without something breaking. <laughs> Do you know any more about that part of the story? Because I want to figure out how it all ends for him. I'm hoping it all ends well. Well, in 1870, his wife Sophia dies. Oh. And then six months after that, something else happens. So this is a marriage certificate between Frederick John Durban and Sarah King. 
Wasn't he already married to her? Haven't I seen that somewhere? That's right. There What's was a marriage in 1856. I see. So she's... Even though they were already married, they did it again legally this time because his wife had passed away, Sophia, at this point. This was about six months after Sophia He didn't hang died. about, did he? He thought, he I'm going to get this sorted now before yes. I get found out. Was yeah. always the chance that someone else could have discovered this, even after the fact? Yes, they were taking a chance, and the marriage in Deptford was actually by bands, which meant that uh, the bands were read out yes. in church three consecutive Sundays before they actually married. So um, if anyone had, from Croydon had been in Deptford in church... They could have shouted out. Hang on a minute, yes. Mm. And, and something that intrigues me, and whether you'll be able to answer this, I don't know, was whether these two families knew of each other. Was this an arrangement or was yes. it very sort of cloak and dagger? Yes. Well, we have no actual evidence, but no. you might like to have a look at this document. So this is a will. That's right. Of Frederick John Durban. It's quite hard to read, even though it is beautiful. We have a transcript, if it helps. Thank you very much. Frederick John Durban, do will and bequeath to my daughter Sophia Elizabeth Rowe five pounds. Would you have been delighted? Oh, it's worth having. A fiver? I wouldn't have been delighted, but let's move on. It um, acknowledges her, doesn't it, as his, as oh, his okay. daughter. Oh, OK. All right. So, and then to Charles, his son, five pounds yep. as well. What I've noticed, that Frederick Jr is not mentioned on here. Is that right? Have a look down the names. John Durban. Oh, well, my son, Frederick Durban, five pounds. So he's acknowledged all of his children in one will here. Taking what I know of Frederick Sr, I don't think he would have left that to, uh, as a surprise for the family once he'd passed on. It would have been nice to, to paint a picture in th that they all lived together. Warwick's come to Queen's Road Cemetery in Croydon to find where Frederick Senior is buried. So would this be this curve here? Over this way. See, what happens if it's this one? You'd never be able to tell. It could be this. No. No. I'm oh, sorry, Frederick. I don't think I'm going to exactly find where you are, but I know you're around here somewhere. Without those chance moments, that time that Frederick met Sarah, Without that one encounter, which I would absolutely love to have known what that was, how did they meet? Did he knock on her door one day with some post and, you know, say, oh, hello? And she was just, oh, you know, oh, well, what happened? You know, did they meet in a pub? I mean, it, and... But without that moment, that chance meeting, I wouldn't be standing here now talking about them as a person. You know, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? You know, it's a shame I couldn't have met Frederick Senior because I feel he was the kind of guy I could have got on with. He wasn't a scallywag. Because there was a point in the story where I was thinking, hang on a minute, maybe we've got a bit of a naughty one on our hands here, but uh, he's come out of this, you know, as a decent human being, and, um, yeah, I would have liked to have bought him a pint. Warwick now wants to find out more about his father, Ashley's side of the family. He's on his way to visit him at his home in Herefordshire. I'm not sure what I'm expecting to find as I start to look back on my father's side of the family. My first thoughts are it's not going to be anything particularly exciting or dramatic. Although that said, look at the Durbans on my mum's side of the family. I mean, that was quite the saga. So who knows? Hello. How are you? Oh, 
hours ago. Here at last, eh? <laughs> Come on in, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Come on in. There's not a lot I know about your side of the family beyond Nana and your dad. But you uh, never really talked about it yourself, particularly no. who was before your dad, no, your grandpa. I'm going to sit down and ask him about his family. So, you know, I'm interested to find out. And your dad? Yes. I mean, if you were to kind of imagine a city gent. He was a pinsight suit and rolled umbrella. Really? The that umbrella was yeah, well. that was perfect. Yeah, the... Bowler hat? Oh, definitely. Wow. Yeah, 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 the bowler hat. I found a couple of photos. As you can see, you know, you can see the, the hairstyle there, can't you? Chiselled features as well. Yes. You I'm didn't just... inherit that, did you? <laughs> 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 I'm older than him there, though. Would he have been working in London at that point? Yes, he worked in the city as a broker, as I was too. A handsome man. Absolutely. And there he is with the lady that started it all for you. My man. Wow, she looks different. I can't even recognise her. <laughs> Seriously, he looks like a completely different person. Well, how about that picture there? Wow. With, you see, I can see her in that a little bit more, that picture. Because you can see there's a glint in her eye there, because she used to have quite a sense of humour as well. Yeah. A wicked sense of humour, actually. Yeah. <laughs> this is the uh, certificate of marriage from my mum and dad. And I can see Nana's first name here. Edith. Edith. Louise. And then Dennis John Manning was a waiter, Nana's father. Yes. Apparently he was, a, he was an Irish waiter. I knew that there might be some Irish. See, I thought the Davis bit was Irish, but it's not that bit. It's, no. it's Nana's side, the Manning side. Yes. But do you know any more? No, I know nothing about him because Mum never really mentioned him, never had a conversation about him. Did he go back to Ireland? Did he disappear? I don't know. Mm. So I think that's what I've got to do, is try and discover more about Dennis. That will be into the unknown. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Warwick wants to get to the bottom of why his grandmother Edith didn't appear to know her father, Dennis John Manning. After chatting to my dad yesterday, I don't feel particularly enlightened about his side of the family. His grandfather, Dennis Manning, um, there wasn't really anything to say. Uh, which is interesting, because I was thinking that my nan Edith was born in 1911, so the war wasn't far away, and perhaps Dennis, her father, was involved somehow with the war, and that's why we, we don't know much about him at this point. But yeah, I'm determined to uncover the mystery of what happened to Dennis. Warwick's meeting genealogist Olivia Robinson. This is the marriage certificate for Dennis mm -hmm. and great-grandmother. So there we have Dennis John Manning and Lucy Louise Topping getting married in 1903 in Lambeth. Bachelor and spinster. Just checking that because on the <laughs> other side of the family it was uh, some shenanigans. Worth checking. Yes. <laughs> and Lucy was actually living this address here. Used to be a pub called the Cock and Bottle. China Walk in Lambeth. Yeah, which is about... The cock and bottle. 500 yards. Is that direction. rhyming slang for something else? <laughs> I'm sure you could find something for that. So it's not far from here? Not far at all. I don't know if you can tell, make out, Dennis's occupation at the time of his marriage. Let's see. Rank or profession? Licensed victualler manager. Yeah, so he's a manager of a pub. And her address is a pub. So she may well have been living in rooms behind the pub she or the barmaid. she could have been the barmaid, exactly. Ah. What I'll show you next um, yep. perhaps takes us a little bit further on in his life. So we've got a birth certificate for Dennis John Robert. And his father was Dennis John Manning. So who's that then? I guess if we can call this one Baby Dennis, perhaps. We'll go with Baby Dennis then. OK, when married? 11th of April 1903, and baby Dennis was born 30th of July 1903. They didn't hang about, did they? 
Yes. So this is April. Uh, yes, so I know. Married in April. <laughs> no. Have they got? And it's amazing. It's a very, very quick gestation. So Dennis was unexpected, probably, and thought, "We've got to get married to make this proper." It was actually relatively common occurrence for women to be pregnant at the altar, as it were. Somewhere between one in four, one in five brides was already expecting at the time of their. A lot of rather marriage. large wedding dresses are still. In my own life and marriage, a similar thing happened that we, uh, our son was born very shortly after we got married. That's extraordinary. What a link. Indeed. So if we take it on a little bit further now. So I've got a death certificate. Dennis John Robert Manning. Oh, so this is baby Dennis, who died when he was eight months old. Of the cute tubercular meningitis. Eight months old. That must have been really hard for their parents. And it says here that his mum was present at the death. Yeah. Mm. <sighs> I mean, for me, I mean, this is... We, um, my wife and I had a, a baby boy who died when he was 11 days old, and um, so we can... We can understand how this is, how it would have been for these, yeah. these parents here. But, I mean, knowing a child for eight months as well is probably even more difficult because you get to know their character, their personality, and, and then, uh, yeah, that must have been hard. Around about one in seven children would have died before they were one at, at this time which is not to deny the trauma that the parents would have gone through. But in some ways, the community around them, the fact that it was a bit more common, it may have been easier for the family to have talked about it, to have had a support network. So Yeah, there might uh, have been other people who had had a similar experience yeah. not too far away. Yeah. But it's worth saying here that Dennis, the father, and Lucy go on to have 11 children in total. They lose this child and they lose one other child, but nine, nine of their children survive into Adam. Yes, including Edith. My nan. Mm -hmm. So now I know that Dennis had 11 children, mm -hmm. nine survived and my nan was one of those, mm -hmm. but I still don't know what happened to Dennis. Hopefully this will give you a clue as to where you may want to look next. Right, this is a birth certificate of Brian Austin, another one of my nan's brothers. And Dennis, his father at this time, he was a munitions worker. Yeah. So that's to do with the war effort then. Yeah. So making ammunition. Mm. Where would he have been doing this? For somebody living in South London, it's most likely that he'd have been involved at Woolwich, at the Woolwich, Woolwich Arsenal, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. I've heard of that. Yes. I it thought it was still... a football team. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess to uh, find out more, that's where I need to go. Thanks to Olivia, I feel I know a little bit more about Dennis. Um, and I also feel a certain affinity towards the man because, like me, he lost a baby son they were very young. And so I, I, I do feel a connection with him now in that way. But I'm on my way to Woolwich Arsenal, which is where he's working, helping with the war effort. And it, it begs the question, did this contribute to his disappearance? By the time Dennis was working at the Arsenal in Woolwich, it had been manufacturing weapons for over 200 years. During the First World War, it expanded its operations massively to meet the demand from the Western Front for guns and shells. At its peak, 80,000 men and women were employed here, including Dennis, who at 42 was too old to be conscripted to fight in the war. I want to get a sense of what life might have been like working here 
for someone like Dennis. It was stressful, it was hard work. And in 1915, he would probably be working with cordite or lyddite, which were the explosives they used then. TNT comes along later. They're all quite dangerous. TNT is very poisonous. And these chemicals made you feel ill. They made you giddy and tired. They gave you headaches, particularly cordite. It gave people very severe headaches. My goodness. And we've horrendous. got an image here of people working with explosives. They've got the basic of protective clothing on here. They've got gloves on and there's a face mask here as well. But, I mean, there's still exposed skin around their wrists and their, yes. their face and neck. And it's thought that TNT's absorbed through the skin, whereas cordite poisons you through breathing. But you notice some of them don't have masks. No. It's mainly the chaps. They're not wearing masks at all, are they? Sleeves rolled up. Not only did munition workers like Dennis risk being poisoned, they also faced another constant threat, that the chemicals might explode at any time. On top of these hazardous conditions, they worked long shifts, often with no days off, in the drive to keep Britain's war machine supplied. So uh, I'm imagining my great-grandfather having to come and work here every day, the stress of the long hours and the, the conditions here, and the danger as well. But what could have happened to him beyond his work here. I mean, the, the, the trail is very difficult to follow. And my grandmother, she had very little recollection of him, and my dad knew nothing of him. So he wasn't a figure that featured in their lives. We know that he didn't die here. We know that he died somewhere else, and we've got a copy of his death certificate for you to have a look at. So, this is dated 1918. Dennis John Manning, and the cause of death, general paralysis. Perhaps the way to look further into this is to look at where he died. Croydon Mental Hospital, does that say? Yes, I think it does. Oh. Because I'm trying to think, you know, how would you end up in a mental hospital, you know, was there stress involved here? You know, is it to do with working here under the conditions that he was working under? What happened? Warwick's come to Bethlehem Museum of the Mind, where the records from Croydon Mental Hospital are kept. He's meeting psychiatrist Rob Howard. So, Rob, here is my great-grandfather's death certificate, and on here it's documented he died at Croydon Mental Hospital. Mm. So what I'm wondering is, did the work he was doing at Woolwich Arsenal, you know, the stress and the, the difficult conditions there, basically drive him mad? OK. OK, so let's have a look at the records. If we go to the entry... This is an amazing book. Every single patient who came into Croydon at Mental Hospital would have had an entry. So here we are. There he is, Dennis John Manning. And... Let's look at the date he was admitted, 29th of June, 19... Is that 14? 17. 1917. Facts indicating insanity observed by myself at time of examination can hear ventriloquists talking in the ward, sees imaginary people walking about, memory defective, talks incoherently, no idea of time or place, very resistive at times. Well, you can understand exactly why he was brought to a mental health hospital Absolutely. with those symptoms. But re read on, because you can hear something here about what your great-grandmother uh, reported. His wife, Lucy Manning, 118 Burlington Road, Thornton Heath says he has been failing mentally for the past two years. He's been violent and threatened her, and she had to run away from him. Says men are in the house with her, 
attacked her violently and she had to call in the police. So it sounds like she had a terrible time, you know, dealing with having to call the police. It's a terrible situation all round, isn't it? Mm. And so bringing him to hospital was obviously, you know, the thing to do. It was a place of safety for him, it was safety for her. But then, this is her husband, let's not forget, somebody she loved, somebody she had children with, and then to have to basically report him mm. mentally ill and knowing that that would mean he'd be taken away, you know, in spite of the fact that he was violent and threatening. But a difficult decision for but, her at the same time. But here, we, 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 she actually gives what she thinks has caused his mental health difficulties. I consider long hours of work and smell arising from such work, which made his head ache. Now, that's interesting, cordite. Mm -hmm. So it's clear what she thinks has caused the problem, but cordite isn't the cause of general paralysis. That's right. He now admits that he was, for some time, before he was 21, suffering from syphilis, for which he was treated at the Lock Hospital in London. Right. So I know what that is. And that... that virus, could that then cause other things? So, yeah, so syphilis is a complicated infection. Unfortunately, in a proportion of cases, the germ stays in your body, and, and manifest later. And it results, I'm afraid, in these horrible central nervous system manifestations as well as uh, affecting the heart and, and the great blood vessels. So general paralysis, mm. general paralysis of the insane, as it was fully called, was actually a manifestation of syphilis. So then this concludes that his mental illness and his ultimate death had no connection with the work he was doing at Woolwich Arsenal. I think that's right. But there's something else very interesting in, mm. in, in these records that tells us something about his character. Just read from here, Warwick. He thought after that he had better not marry for some time. As a matter of fact, he did not marry till he was 31. So he waited at least 10 years after he'd been infected before he got married, mm. which would have been unusual at, at that period, but no doubt that was motivated by his not wishing to, to, you know, to pass He's on. He was doing the right thing yeah, then, wasn't absolutely, he? Yeah. absolutely. Well, it's certainly not the... not the reason I thought he was going to be here. I was convinced it was going to be connected to his work at hmm. Woolwich Arsenal and the, the, the chemicals or the, or the stress that, that uh, workers were under. And it's interesting that your great-grandmother thought that. But, I mean, it's good to see he was being very responsible about it, you know, in... I think that's right. I think he comes out well, doesn't he? Really? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, his reputation does. It didn't end well for him, though, did it? I mean, no. it's, it, it, it couldn't have been a more tragic story or ending to the story. I think that's it's, right. It's, you know, what a way to go, honestly. Dennis died when he was 46, which is my age. And I feel relatively young, so it's it's no time to, to go, is it? And my nan, Edith, was only six years old when he died a tragic death. And I think this gives us the answer as to why she didn't know her father. I think there would have been a certain amount of shame associated with a relative being in an asylum. So he probably wouldn't have really been talked about which is really sad. And it's, it's sad that I can't tell my nan because she's no longer here. Having solved the mystery of what happened to his grandmother Edith's father, Dennis John Manning, Warwick has one more thing he wants to discover about the Mannings. His father told him that Dennis was Irish. To find out if he really does have any Irish ancestry, Warwick is meeting historian Graham Davis. So, Graham, can the Mannings be traced back to Ireland? Well, we know that your great 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 grandparents, Owen and Margaret, lived in 1851 in this little street, Maidstone Street, off the main thoroughfare there in London, on the fringes of London, actually, as it was then. And we can look at the census. 
1851, the same year, to see the family recorded in that house in Maidstone Street. Okay, so I'm seeing Manning here, yeah. Owen Manning, living at number 22, the head of the household. And he was a labourer. And uh, Wareborn Island. So there is Irish ancestry. Definitely. And if you look at his wife, Margaret... There she is, there's Margaret, wife. And she's from County Longford. It's in Leinster province. So I'm slightly intrigued as to why Owen and Margaret came over to this country. Mm -hmm. uh, is this another famine story? Were they? No, no, if you look at the dates, your great, great, great grandparents yeah. must have come across in the 1820s long before the famine, which starts in 1845 through to 52. So if they were planning a family at this yeah, point, yeah. they might have thought, actually, let's, yeah. let's move now and yes. then we'll be in a better position to support. Yes. Uh, London wages were better, there were more opportunities. And also, not only could they earn more money, there were opportunities for the children and they could get schooling, which they couldn't do in Ireland. So with this in mind, how much Irishness is in me now? Well, it's difficult to know, isn't it? Um, <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. A little finger, perhaps. I think a little bit. And another little sort of Irish connection mm. is that I have played leprechauns in seven different films in my really? career. Yes. I've wow. got a very dodgy Irish accent, but I'm not going to do it for you now. Warwick's confirmed he does have Irish roots, thanks to his great-great-great-grandparents, Owen and Margaret Manning and he's already discovered the sad fate of their grandson, Dennis John Manning, who died of syphilis. But he knows nothing about the man who links them, his great-great-grandfather, also called Dennis. Now, the person I'm most interested in finding out more about is my great-great-grandfather, Dennis, here, who at this point was 17, yeah. a labourer like his father. Yes. What happened next? Well, we do have the census of 1881, 30 years on, and here you'll find Dennis again. Right, this is Dennis, the head of the household here, who's now 48. Mm -hmm. He's a musician. Yes. Wow, that's yes. cool. Yes. Musician stands out, doesn't it? it I mean, does. could you make a living being a musician? Well, we do have some information about what he's up to. Dennis, now this is from the Northampton Mercury. 12th of June, 1858. Entertainment. Yes. Pell's American Opera Troupe gave an entertainment at the Town Hall on Wednesday week. The troupe consists of Messrs G. W. Pell, the original Bones, <laughs> D. Manning, that's Dennis, violinist, H. W. Page, solo banjoist, etc., etc., etc. The performance on the violin and banjo were good, so we got a good review there. Mm, yeah. And elicited applause. <laughs> uh, the assembly was not large. No. So not a great crowd, <laughs> no. but they applauded But they loudly. did well. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, so we now know Dennis is a violinist. Mm. So he was playing with Pell's American Opera Troupe. Mm. But there's a banjo involved here as well, so it must have been quite an unusual sort of opera. Perhaps a, a trip to Northampton. Of course, in the Northampton Mercury. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, when I started out on this journey, I was convinced I wasn't going to find any other performers. But, lo and behold, there is one. I'm excited to find out more, actually, and just kind of learn what sort of music he was playing and how accomplished he became. Warwick's come to the Guildhall in Northampton to meet Rachel Cowgill, who's been looking into the musical career of his great-great-grandfather, Dennis Manning. So, Rachel, I have here a review of Pell's American Opera Troupe, yep. of which my great-great-grandfather, Dennis Manning, was a member, in fact, a violinist. So I'm intrigued. Who were Pell's American Opera Troupe and, you know, what sort of music did they play? Well, they were a group of American musicians that were touring the UK, 1858-59. Pell was an impresario. He recruited musicians in America, brought them with him, but also, we think, en route 
picked up one or two talented musicians to join the ensemble. So they might have needed a violinist, and uh, my great-great-grandfather fitted the bill. They presumably they met up with him at some point and were really impressed sufficiently to invite him to join what was actually quite a small ensemble, small group. Right. I mean, what type of music was it? I mean, did they play opera or...? They did include opera in their performances, mm. but it tended to be a sort of parody, sort of slightly mocking. But at the same time, with this type of performance, they blended it with comedy and physical humour and dance, and it was a real mixed bag, a real variety of a stuff. A real variety show. Yeah, it sounds, yeah, real, I'd love to variety. see it. I mean, it sounds fantastic to discover that, you know, in my ancestry there is a history of performance, in particular comedy, perhaps, and slapstick. It's, it's great. Yeah. It's great to discover that. So, this is another document you might find very interesting. Oh, I love these playbills. Yeah. Fantastic. From the Music Hall in Shrewsbury. Mm hmm Grand Fashionable American Entertainments. Yes. I love it. Entertainments, plural there. So, a reunion of celebrated and original American minstrels. And we've got the real delineators of Ethiopian character. And then we've got Pell during his stay at St James's Theatre at the honour of performing in the presence of Her Most Gracious Majesty the Queen. Indeed, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'm looking at this. Yeah. The minstrels, were they the top of the bill here? Or, or Pell? Uh, what do you reckon? But um, the American minstrels and Pell's opera troupe are one and the same. This is all referring to their performance. Wow. So... Opening chorus, happy are we? I'm not going to say that. Yeah. You can't. I mean, obviously, this is of a time. Yes, absolutely. With this style of performance, we have a real difficulty from a 21st century perspective looking at the, the terminology. There's all sorts of instances on here, aren't yeah. there? Yeah. Oh, take your time, Miss Lucy, take your time, Miss Lucy. Minstrel shows originally came from America. Over there, blacked-up performers presented an often bawdy and demeaning parody of African-American songs and manners. The version that developed in Britain was aimed at a more respectable family audience. But the minstrels carried on presenting racial caricatures in their shows. So does this mean that my great-great-grandfather Dennis blacked up at some point? Yes, he did. He would have been part of the ensemble performance. They all blacked up at this point. Uh, so that, that's very difficult for us now. Yeah. I think it's fascinating, the, the range of materials that you have here. Is there anything of my great-great-grandfather at all? There is. Oh. There is. There is an image. It's very fuzzy, mm. but it's something at least. And I'll just show this to you. This is... Um, a newspaper article. Again, some of this text is similar to what we've just seen. But right in the middle there, we've got a representation of That's Pell's there. American opera troupe. Now, it's not a passport photo, is it? It's not. It's fuzzy, but you can see in the middle there... There's a violinist. There's a violinist. He's right in the middle of that ensemble. He is, isn't he? Yeah, he's right in the middle. Center and state. this was at the uh, Athenaeum Lecture Hall. Barry St Edmunds, positively for two nights only. If you miss it... That's it. Going. It's gone. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's fabulous, isn't it? What an amazing discovery. shot when I first discovered exactly the sort of musician that Dennis was. It's a, I don't know, I don't really know quite how to feel about it at this point. It's, um, on one hand, it kind of amuses me because I'm thinking, well, yeah, I mean, that's what it was back then. And, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm almost slightly horrified by it. We've kind of started to learn about Dennis and the fact that he was a violinist and he went on tour. I'm thinking, yes, this is terrific. Then that was the bombshell right there, wasn't it? Bigamy, syphilis, blacking up as a minstrel. Uh, it's, it's quite a variety of, um, of ancestry.
Warwick's come to meet music historian Derek Scott at the Athenaeum in Bury St. Edmunds, where Dennis Manning performed with Pell's American Opera Troupe in 1858. Dennis Manning, my great-great-grandfather, he was the son of an Irish labourer. Right? So how does he end up playing music of this type? The thing is, how does he get from Irish music mm. into African-American music? And there are a surprising number of links, both socially and culturally. I mean, in New York, you would get adjacent neighbourhoods of free black Americans and, and poor Irish. Mm. So there's some linking there. But musically, too, if I play you a typical popular a minstrel song of the period, the Camptown ladies sing this song, do da, do da, the Camptown racetrack five miles long, oh, do da day. You can see, to make that into a reel, I'd only really have to do something like this. That's amazing. And it's, it's suddenly the different style. Yeah, it is. And, and, and they're not poles apart at all, are they? No, not really. What makes it African-American is it has a device called call and response. You've got the one bit like that, and then the do-da, do-da. I don't know how you are on do-das. You, you wanna... I'm not if, bad at a do-da. If I do... The, oh, if you're accomplished oh, yes. with do-das, <laughs> I'll try the, the narrative bit. And I'll and get ready do the do-da. Yeah, right. OK. So, uh, the Camptown ladies sing this song. Do-da, do-da. The Camptown racetrack five miles long. Do-da, do-da day. I don't that's know whether I did that right. Then. But that's right. Yes. It's a throwing it to and yeah. fro. So there's a kind of influence from the Afri African American side into Irish music and from Irish music into African American music. Now we know that Dennis played the violin in a very successful touring group. Is that what he did throughout his career? If I show you something a little later on from the era, right down the bottom there, you'll find comments on what he's doing later. This is an important notice to concert hall proprietors. Mr D Manning, late musical director of Pell's Opera Troupe. So he's with the musical director? Yes, actually. that's right. Sentimental vocalist, guitarist and solo violinist. Yeah, notice that. It's not just violinist now, is it? It isn't. Sentimental vocalist, what does that mean in musical terms? Even in the 50s, minstrels were playing some sentimental songs. One of the great favourites of, of your great-great-grandfather's troupe was the Hazel Dell. All alone my watch I'm keeping in the Hazel Dell For my darling Nellie's near me sleeping Nellie, dear, farewell Warwick, you, Dear, the lady you've, you've sung, back. haven't you? I'm, I'm sure I've seen you in performance. Not as well as Sing, you, sir. Singing, <laughs> singing. Is oh, there any lovely. chance I can It's lovely. It's very sentimental. <laughs> I'm trying to divert you away from asking me to sing. Do not ask me to sing. I'm just wondering, if, you know, to join me in the chorus <laughs> on this, you know, uh, without know. the tears rolling down your I voice. don't know the words. Well, as it <laughs> happens... <laughs> <laughs> By amazing coincidence. Oh, Derek. I have some words. <sighs> yeah, OK. So I've just got to join in with this bit here. Yeah, just the chorus. Yes, just the chorus. <laughs> but you must sing as well. Don't stop. None of that. OK. All right. Shall we try just the all alone? All alone, yeah, yeah. All alone, my watch I'm keeping in the hazel dell for my dark. Lovely. And that's quite touching to think that my great great grandfather Dennis would have sung that as well. And now I can that's sing it. No, <laughs> but the last document we have has to be the death certificate. I'll, I'll let I've you... seen a fair number of these on my travels over the last few uh, days. Yeah. 1890, Dennis Manning died at 52. Oh, if, if you look at the address he's living at, 6 Betterton Street, 
This is in the Covent Garden area. We know that number six was actually a boarding house. It was licensed for 95 boarders. It, it's... 95? Unfortunately, it does look as if um, Dennis Manning was on his, on his uppers when when he died. So, uh, well, you know, uh, from, from the great days, I, I hate to end on this kind of note for you. Well, the journey was lovely. His story was inspiring and enjoyable, but kind of ended too soon, in a way. And at not particularly age, happily, obviously, for him. You'd so think he'd dead. be at the peak of his career. Yes. You? Yeah, you would, wouldn't you? It's just a lesson in the, the insecurity of... Well, it's life one that I know very well as an actor myself. You know, you, you can never take this business for granted and you have to have a plan B. Dennis, I don't think, had a plan B. There mm. you are, the insecurity of the musician. Absolutely. Warwick's come to the ballroom at the Athenaeum, where his great-great-grandfather, Dennis Manning, performed more than 150 years earlier. It's lovely to actually be somewhere that one of my ancestors actually was. To think that Dennis was in this very room doing what he loved doing, entertaining people. That's a really lovely feeling. And I'm just enjoying being here and kind of soaking the atmosphere up. Part of me feels slightly guilty having unearthed all of these family secrets. And I'm sort of imagining my ancestors looking down, saying, who do you think you are? Unearthing all of our secrets, <laughs> telling the world. The thing that strikes me about their stories is there was always a struggle. There was always a fight and a determination in them. And I've got that as well. I've got a determination to succeed and to get through life in the best way possible and do things the right way as well. So I've got a great deal of respect for all of the people in the stories that I've told.